Good afternoon. I'm Toby Graham, director of the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library and deputy university librarian. And on behalf of the University of Georgia Libraries, welcome. We are so pleased to have you here uh, for what is really a very special program uh, with Judson Mitchum, Georgia's poet laureate and very soon to be inductee in the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. Uh, this is an event that we've really been looking forward to all year since the judges uh, decided last year that uh, Judson would be uh, this year's inductee along with uh, posthumously Tony, Tony Cade uh, Bambara. I'd like to thank the Georgia Council for the Arts for its uh, co-sponsorship. I um, want to acknowledge uh, Libby Morris, our uh, provost, center provost. Thank you so much for being here and making a stop on what I know is a a tour of uh, the many events that we have, I think more than 60 events that we have going on on campus uh, over the, our Spotlight of the Arts Festival. So thank you and Hugh Rupersberg, uh, Hughes Rupersberg, um, Vice Provost, and, uh, and all the folks who are here. I want to extend a special welcome to the members of the University of Georgia's, uh, the library's Board of Visitors. And if you're on our Board of Visitors, could you just stand real quickly and, and be recognized? along with our, uh, our chair, uh, Rob Gibson. Thank you all for everything that you do. Um, this, is a, this group of people, they are just such great friends of the University of Georgia and of the libraries, and, uh, and their signature accomplishment is this building that we are in right now. And I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the board of the Georgia Review, who are, have just met uh, here in this building, and, and their uh, uh, co-chairs, Diane Smock and Sandra Scott, and if we have any of the, the review board, if you could uh, could just stand up real quickly and be and be recognized. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have with us two other Hall of Famers, um, and so I want to acknowledge uh, you all as well. Uh, Philip Lee Williams, uh, I see uh, right here. Thank you, Phil. Phil is going to. Uh, be with us uh, tomorrow, and, and he will be uh, introducing and inducting Judson. And we also have Melissa Faye Green. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here with us. And uh, Melissa, uh, in addition to, uh, to being uh, one of our, our Hall of Famers along with Phil, they also uh, serve on the, the Board of Judges. So very much appreciate what they do. I know that we have some other uh, of our Georgia Writers Hall of Fame uh, panelists uh, here as well this evening. And, and could our panelists, uh, our, our judges, please uh, stand so that I could acknowledge you. I see Neely and Julie and Hugh and John Lowe, Dr. Stephen Corey back there. Thank you. Thank you for all that they do to make this, uh, make this program possible. Um, and and uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge George and Nancy Montgomery, who, who are not here this evening, but whose uh, $1 million gift to the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame endow this program and enable us to do this uh, every year. And through the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame, the Hargrit Library and the University of Georgia, you know, takes the opportunity to celebrate Georgia writers, past and present, and to acknowledge the rich literary legacy of our state. And tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we'll, uh, we'll induct Judson Mitchum uh, and Tony Cade Bambara into the hall. Uh, Skip Hewlett, Skip, you raise your hand over there. Skip Hewlett has uh, curated an exhibit uh, here at the library on the, the life and works of, uh, of both uh, Judson and, and Tony Cade Bambara that will uh, be opening uh, right after this event this evening. So I hope that you'll stay around to see that and also to enjoy the reception down the hall. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the person who will introduce Judson. Um, Karen Patey is director of the Georgia Council for the Arts. And as such, she's responsible for bringing awareness and visibility to the role of, that the arts bring in assisting economic development, creating vibrant communities, and contributing to a strong curriculum. She's traveled across Georgia to engage, educate, and excite audiences about the arts, and in recognition of her valuable contribution, was named one of Georgia's 100 most, most influential Georgians uh, by Georgia Trend, by Neely Young back there. Um, and so, uh, Karen, will you join us, please? Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Toby. Thank you for having me here with you today. I'm going to have to ask you to excuse the, my voice. The cold wasn't enough to keep me away. Uh, this is a really special weekend, and I'm happy to be here. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Judson Mitchum to you today. Georgia's 10th Poet Laureate Judson was inducted by Governor Nathan Deal in May of 2012. He is both an award-winning poet and novelist. His poetry has been widely published in literary journals, including Poetry, Chattahoochee Review, Harper's, The Georgia Review, Hudson Review, and The Southern Review. He has been awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Creative Writing, and has been the recipient of a Pushcart Prize. Judson is also the first writer to twice win the Townsend Prize for Fiction, one for his first novel, The Sweet Everlasting, and then for his second, Sabbath Creek. Judson currently teaches writing at Mercer in Macon, and his most recent book, A Little Salvation, Poems Old and New, was published by the University of Georgia Press. And while that all gives you a great sense of Judson's bio and his accomplishments, I feel that I would be remiss to be here with you today and not tell you a little bit more about what I know of Judson. I believe that if you are lucky in your life, you come across people, one or two, that will remind you of the true art of conversation, of the power of giving words their true space to live their full meaning spoken or on a page, of the value of a pause or of a thought left to linger. Through both his writing and his friendship, Judson does just that. <clears throat> and after every meeting with him, generally, which involves a very long lunch, I am left to remember how very lucky I am to be able to pause in his space. As the Poet Laureate, Judson was given just one sole responsibility, and that was to serve as the statewide voice for the value of reading, writing, and literacy in the lives of all Georgians. And as such, that conversation could have just been about Judson's work and Judson's voice, but that is not how Judson approaches things. From our very, very first call, what Judson brought to this position was a deep desire to talk about so much more than his work, but to be a vocal champion for the literary artists in our state. His vision for the role of poet laureate, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> has always been about increasing awareness for the incredibly talented work of contemporary poets and writers in our state and for the long literary history of Georgia. It has been just a great pleasure to work with Judson and get to know him. And I am so excited for all the work that lies ahead. I can think of no better or more deserving individual to be inducted into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. So please join me in a warm welcome for Judson Mitchum. Well, thank you, Karen, for that extraordinary introduction. I want to begin how saying, by saying how very honored I am to be included in this Hall of Fame. I have some things to say about what it means to me, but I will reserve those comments for the ceremony tomorrow. I want to make an announcement now, uh, today in collaboration with the Georgia Council for the Arts. I'm announcing a new series of statewide initiatives to be launched in the coming year as a means of fostering appreciation for and awareness of the art of poetry and the work of Georgia writers. The first to be implemented will be the Georgia Poet Laureate's Prize to be awarded annually for an original poem written by a Georgia high school student. A winner and four finalists will be selected by the Poet Laureate. The competition will be open to all Georgia high school students, public, private, or homeschooled, and is intended to complement the existing NEA-sponsored Poetry Out Loud recitation project co coordinated locally by the Georgia Council for the Arts and the Atlanta History Center. Students are invited to submit one original poem, no more than 30 lines, for consideration. Results of the competition will be announced in April. Selected poets will be honored with an award ceremony at the Georgia State Capitol. 
and all five poems will be published. Guidelines for this will be on the Georgia Council for the Arts website by January the 1st. I'm looking forward to these projects and especially to reading the work of Georgia's young poets. And I will read all of them. <laughs> I've been asked to read a few selections from my work and I've chosen to read poetry. Poetry reading is a curious phenomenon. It is, yes, a performance and one that I enjoy giving. But my hope is always that it will instill in the listener a desire to experience the poem in silence. Most poets work on their poems a long, long time, revising them over and over until it is very likely that there is much more on the page that can be grasped upon hearing it or even reading it once. A performance can, of course, be the primary event, and that's fine. But that's a different kind of phenomenon, closer to the stage than the page. Writers are sometimes asked who their audience is. Well, it's you, all of you. That would be my answer. I see no reason to specify further, except to say that in this, I do not mean you as a collective here. I don't mean this audience listening to my voice right now, but you individually reading in silence at some other time. Then it is the poem that must perform, and it must do so on the page. It either holds the attention and does the work of poetry, or it does not. All the poems I've chosen to read this afternoon have some connection to a specific person to whom the poem will be dedicated for the purposes of this reading. I'll begin with a poem from my mother. I'm a sentimental person. If I choke up, I'm going to choke up. And that will happen. Um, runs in our family. A poem from my mother who taught me how to dribble a basketball. She had been a guard back in the days of the half-court game designed for girls, who were, everyone knew, oh my goodness, too delicate to run full court. When we were young, she still had the touch. She still had that touch. Actually, my sister Linda also had the touch. She was a guard as well, though my brother Ben and I were obsessed to an unhealthy degree with playing sports. And though we were both starters on a team that went to the state tournament in basketball, our sister remains the only winner of a state championship. Linda, I take this opportunity to acknowledge this publicly. <laughs> Ben and I played against Newton County High during their historic stretch of 129 straight home game wins. Matched at that time, and perhaps still, I don't know, only by the University of Kentucky's 129 game streak. This poem is for my mother entitled The Touch. You stepped out the back door drying your hands on a plain white apron and watching me slap the new basketball down on the driveway's nearly flat hard pan, unable to control it or to stall for long, it's falling still. You held out clean, wrinkled hands for the ball, let it drop and caught the rise with the fingertips, never with the palm, allowing no sound but the ball's hollow bounce, crouching low, either small hand moving with the ball, and years later, when the Newton County Rams came down like the cavalry at dawn on a few Cheyenne and a hot breath man-to-man -man press, the best plan was to get the ball to me. Even now, I return to that late fall morning when you taught me what a softer touch could do, how to go where I needed to, never looking down. The next poem I'm dedicating to my friend and teacher, Roger Thomas. For many years, the head of the psychology department here at this university. It was Roger who put me to work as a writer, who accepted no excuses. He wanted a draft. His expression was, put black on white. When he got that draft on his desk, he worked it over and over and gave it back to me, and we did that again and again and again 
I was writing papers related to our work in physiological psychology, a discipline that emphasized economy and precision in the use of language. Roger showed me what it meant to have a style, even within a restricting format. When we finished our work, sometimes we'd have a beer, pick a little guitar. And that too was important for me as a writer, since I began to write poems after trying for years to write songs for the guitar. I went from writing songs to writing just the lyrics and then from song lyrics to poetry. When I taught psychology, I used to show videos from an excellent series called The Mind. One segment was about a British musician named Clive Waring who had contracted a virus that destroyed his hippocampus and temporal lobes bilaterally so that none of his short-term memories could ever be transferred to long-term. Clive was and is trapped in the present and the distant past, becoming ever more distant. You could tell him the same joke over and over and the same bad news forever. He would always forget it. But he recognized his wife, Deborah, whom he loved deeply, and every time she came into the room, he would leap to his feet and embrace her as if he hadn't seen her in years, even though she may have left the room minutes before. The second part of this poem is a short guzzle, a formal poem of Persian origin made of couplets with a strict pattern of repetition at the end of the second line of the couplet. It's entitled Forever. I will never forget Clive Waring and his wife, Deborah. Every term for a decade teaching intro psychology, I showed the same video. A virus had destroyed his hippocampus. He came home one day with a headache that would not quit. Three days later, he was shipwrecked in the past. That day he came home, and the right now, whenever Deborah opened his door, having, having left him only seconds before, Clive leapt to his feet. He hadn't seen her in years. He'd swing her in his arms. He would sing. In line after line of his diary, he wrote, Awake for the first time now, and I adore Deborah forever. Who will give us tomorrow forever? There's a moon in the window forever. What's the long night for, and who will tell us? There is no way to ask, though, forever. Will you think of me lost in the old house? How can I miss you so and forever? Will you wake in the night without sadness? There is nowhere to go now, forever. And whoever I am, here's my answer. In our small boat, we'll row out forever. All my life, it seems, I have been baffled by the fact of other people, so many of them, all of them under the impression that their lives are as important as mine. <laughs> I remember the first, first feeling this when I was about 10 years old at a Georgia football game. The feeling is a common one. One of my favorite essays, uh, by William James addresses it on a certain blindness, it's called. And I understand it better now, but I still have it, that feeling of being engulfed and almost negated by the multitude. What better place to see a crowd than the Atlanta airport? Many times I've exited a plane, walked out into the multitude, and felt an acute aloneness at the end of my journey. This poem is for the late Clifford Jett, minister at Monroe First Baptist Church when I was a boy, a man of courage who stood and spoke hard words against his congregation when it voted to exclude blacks from membership. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, he reminded us, all ye. This was a man of faith, who also knew despair. The poem is entitled, The Multitude. 
The woman in the airplane wanted to talk about Christ. I did not. I raised my magazine. She continued saying, Christ promised heaven to the thief who believed while nailed to the cross. The clouds looked solid far beneath. She began the story of her life, and I stopped her as politely as I could, saying, please, right now, I'd simply like to read. And for a while, she did keep quiet. Then she asked if I'd ever really given Christ a chance. So I tried telling her a joke chose the one about the Pope and Richard Nixon in a rowboat. She discovered nothing funny in the story. <laughs> Jesus fed the multitude, she said. I looked around to find an empty seat. There wasn't one. She asked me if I knew about the sower and the seed, about Zacchaeus, Legion and the swine, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, the rich young ruler, and I did. I knew about them all. I told her, yes, sweet Jesus. Got the stewardess to bring another bourbon. <laughs> Tried to buy the missionary one, but she declined. And when the plane sat down, I'd escaped up the aisle, made the door, and started walking fast toward the baggage claim when I saw them all at once on the concourse. Thousands I would never see again who'd remain nothing in my life, who would never have names, and I realized I'd entertained strangely and for no good reason I could see the hope of someone waiting there who loved me. This poem is dedicated to the memory of Stan Lindbergh, the man who brought the Georgia Review to national prominence where it remains today under the strong guidance of Stephen Corey. And it's also dedicated to the memory of Adrian Bond. Adrian was an extremely talented writer of poetry and fiction and essays who taught at Mercer University for 30 years, who began the Georgia Poetry Circuit. Adrian enjoyed this poem, it made her laugh. One of the main ways I taught myself contemporary poetry was by reading reviews in literary magazines. I paid respectful attention to the views of all the critics, since I was sure they knew more than I did, as I had no education in the literary arts. This method has its drawbacks, especially if one adopts the negative biases of the critics, of the reviewers. Some say avoid the first person, some the second, some the third. <laughs> Nothing is left but paralysis and silence, and I was almost there. And when I read a review in poetry that said there were too many men writing poems with birds in them, I had a little breakdown. <clears throat> and I wrote this poem attempting to exorcise the voices that told me everything I might try to do was wrong. It was published in the Georgia Review and reprinted in Harper's, after which I got angry letters from people who apparently did not understand irony. <laughs> I also got letters of support from people who did not understand irony <laughs> and who thought I hated poetry as much as they did. <laughs> Preface to an omnibus review. Do not write poems about poetry. Commit no epigraphs, object poems, homages to anyone. Please, no more elegies for your father. No details of your grandmother's hands. Leave the sepia photographs alone. Give us no Guggenheim, and here I am, bored or overwhelmed poetry. Don't write about divorce. No ironic meditations at the playground or the game. Nothing on the limits of the language. Construct no ugly poems, ragged on the page, but nothing square. Go easy on the birds and the trees. No asleep in the deer stand, waking to an eight-point buck only 30 yards away kind of poetry. <laughs> and no remember that cafe in San Diego poems of heartbreak, not one Rilke imitation, nothing modeled on the Spanish, nothing spoken as Osip Mandelstam or Ekmatova. If ever, on a clear summer night, there's a baseball diamond in a small town a field lighted like a scene in a glass paperweight, an old man loud in the stands. Don't even think it. 
if there's something you believe in, have the decency to keep it to yourself. <laughs> no revelations, no irate manifestos on the earth or deconstructions of the bed, no uppercase God, there should be no nuns, no old Baptist hymns in your poetry. Employ everything you need to make it happen, that momentary stay against confusion, but include no catalogs, no dogs. This is a poem for our first grandchild, Addie, and her parents, Zach and Jana. It's entitled Night. My wife's down the hall, already in bed. I have dozed off here in my recliner, the TV bright but mute. I struggle up to make my little tour. I check the locks and turn off the lights, but at the computer, I take a seat. My son holds his daughter in the photo. She's eight months old. Both meet my eyes evenly as if to say, only the straight truth now, old man, and I can't move. In my son's face, I see love, forgive me. I see time, I do. But in hers, world that was, world that is, world to come. The screensaver times on a field of stars and I am traveling as though on a spacecraft or a planet but alone out into the night. Then, like I'm God, I move my hand and there they are again. This is a poem for our youngest granddaughter, Isabel and her parents, Anna and Jeff. It's entitled Sadness. My daughter says time is making her sad. It's a day of bitter cold deep in winter. And her own little girl, who is not yet two, has shown off new routines. She has twirled and balanced. She has flown through the room with her arms held out like wings. My visit's at an end, and when my daughter lays her head on my shoulder, I think about a morning many years ago now. She was maybe in the first grade, and I was brushing her hair before school. Only moments from the bell. I had to hurry, working at the tangle, but I pulled too hard, and she cried. So I let the time go. And we sat there looking out the window, at the bright fall day. I'm late again, but the baby girl keeps me where I am. She spins and falls and tumbles into laughter. If there's sadness in this, it is the best sadness ever. This is a poem for our grandson Noah, Addie's little brother. This is what happened June before last when my whole family went to the state capitol for me to be sworn in by the governor as the poet laureate. An odd event in itself. I swore only to uphold the Constitution. <laughs> but I had entertained the possibility that I might be taking an oath regarding poetry. Perhaps I would be made to swear I'd avoid the Sestina an oath I would gladly have taken. <laughs> this is entitled, Wait. My grandson, possible iconoclast and almost three means to understand weight, testing things to see what he can lift, what he can move. He shoves a box of books. He hoists a bag of groceries. If he could, he'd push the sofa across the room. So here we are, the whole family in the last days of June visiting the Georgia State Capitol, the building cool and mostly empty in the rotunda and elsewhere, marble busts of famous men on pedestals as heavy as small trucks. My grandson passes through security and runs toward where I'm standing next to Alexander H. Stevens 
immutably white. His eyes open and blank, the vice president of the Confederate States, known for making clear the cornerstone of his new nation, the supremacy of the white race. And in his first oblivious political act, our little Caucasian throws his shoulder into the stone <laughs> as though to take down that pillar where it stands. And I pretend to give him a hand, but I've had my chance. The poet Christopher Smart, who lived in the mid-18th century, is best known for Jubilate Agno, the long, a long poem of religious ecstasy that is an encyclopedic gathering of obscure lore, genealogy, and wordplay. He wrote the poem while confined to an asylum. We know him almost exclusively for one section of the poem, which is an homage to his cat, Jeffrey. But the poem is vast in its reach and amazing in its music and bizarre juxtapositions. It is constructed using the device of anaphora, which involves the repetition of the same word at the beginning of each line, a device used in much ancient Hebrew poetry. The following poem of praise entitled Him was written in the manner of Christopher Smart. The lines beginning with the word let or mine, and those beginning with the word for or his, taken from Jubilate Agno. This is for Jean, to whom I have been married for 43 years, and whose beauty and spirit and grace have been a kind of salvation to me. She is at the heart of my life's deepest meaning, its sweetest happiness. Him. Let the tongue untie itself. Let the Beatitudes do what they do. For there he heard certain words which it was not possible for him to understand. Let the dust rise and walk. On his last day, let the old man lay down a bed. For there is a mystery in numbers. Let the fool do his little dance. Let the lonely go sleepwalking out of the house. For there is a language of flowers. Let the lyre not look at the moon. Let the graveyards guard each beloved from rude apocalypse. For infinite upon infinite they make a chain. Let the blue sky of evening ease us down. Let the glory be a surprise. I have my prayers. For they are together in the spirit every night, like man and wife. My father, Wilson, was a good and gentle man. No one who knew him would dispute that. He's been gone a long time now, but he's with me every day. I know my brother and sister would say the same thing. I've written about him many times, but I will share only this short poem called Last Words. An old woman stands at the casket. Don't he look natural, she asks. I think about the phrase of natural causes, how it indicates a different kind of violence. I do know what she means, and both of us admire the awful craft of the worst undertaking in the world, the taking under. She turns from his petrified face, raised on her tiptoes, she whispers in my ear, I thought so much of your daddy. Odd that I didn't really think of him at all. Or so it seems now that he's a riot in my head. And everything he gave me, which was everything he had, I took that as a given. Only Saturday, we talked on the telephone a while. 
but I can't remember what he said. And I'll end with this poem. And I took my mother to the doctor 20 years ago now. It was because of a bothersome twitch in her eye, which turned out to be the result of a large meningioma in her cerebellum, a benign growth that was anything but benign. After the surgery to remove it, she never returned home, but spent long stretches in hospitals, as well as 13 years in a nursing home. When she was in the hospital, my brother and sister and I were with her as much as we could be. We monitored everything. We kept our own chart on the legal pad, writing notes to one another as our shifts changed when one person who loved her gave way to another. The other shifts changed as well, from one stranger to another people who cared for her, but always in a system of rapid rotation so that none of them ever really knew who she was. Over, this, over time, this lack of understanding, she was not just anyone, she was our mother, came to seem not just wrong to me, but an obscenity. She was not that woman in the bed. She had had a life. So I wrote this poem of introduction. Though I never showed it to any of her caretakers, it's dedicated to my brother Ben and my sister Linda. Our mother's name was Myrtle. An introduction. You who break the dark all night, whisper and shout, who travel in and out of all the rooms, who come with pill or needle, vial or chart, with bedding, mop, and bucket, tray of food, who turn, clean, pull, read, record, pat, and go, who see her hair matted by the pillow, greasy, white, wild, short hair that will shock anyone from home who hasn't seen her for a while, shocking like her bones showing now, like the plum-colored bruises on her arms, like her face when she first comes to and what it says, like her mouth, in the anything it says, call the dogs, or I've got to go to school, or tonight y'all roll that wagon wheel all the way to Mexico. You who have seen three children, unbelieving, unresigned, in all these rooms full of anger and of prayer. You who change her diaper, who empty pans of green and gold bile she has puked up. You who cannot help breathing her decay. I would like to introduce you to our mother, who was beautiful. Her eyes like nightshade, her wavy brown hair with a trace of gold. Myrtle, whose alto flowed through the smooth baritone our father used to sing. Our mother, who would make us cut a switch, but who rocked us and who held us and who kissed us. Myrtle, wizard typist, sharp with figures, masterful with roses and with roast beef, who worked for the New Deal seed loan program for the school, local paper, county agent, and the church, who cared long years for her own failing mother, whom she worries for now. You may have heard her. Who was tender to a fault, may be gullible as the truly good and trusting often are, and even so, who could move beyond fools, though foolishness, foolishness itself delighted her. A double take, words turned around, a silly dance, and when our mother laughed, I tell you this because you haven't heard it, the world could change. As though the sun could shine inside our very bones. And where it's written in Isaiah that the briar won't rise, but the myrtle tree there's a promise unfulfilled. She will not go out with joy. Still, if you had known her, you yourselves, like Isaiah's hills would sing, you'd understand why it says that all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Thank you.
thank you. That was that was remarkable. We really do appreciate that. Um, and I, I do invite all of you uh, to stay afterwards. We have a reception just down the hall. Um, the opening of of the exhibit featuring uh, Judson's work and Tony Cade Bambaras. Hope you'll you'll stay and enjoy that. And I believe uh, that Skip will be there to um, help uh, interpret that for you. Um, and you know, th this is one of, of many events as a part of the George, the uh, spotlight on the arts at UGA. Uh, Arts.uga.edu is where you can go to find out about all the things that are going on. And I hope you will attend many of those so long as none interfere with your participation in tomorrow's induction ceremony, which is at 10 o'clock uh, here at the Special Collections Libraries. So thank you. And another round of applause for Judson Mitchum, our Poet Laureate.